one simple question this evening. What is your most powerful physical feature? Anybody got any options they want to spit at me? Who would think that their shoulders are the most powerful physical attribute? Who thinks their arms? Who thinks their legs? What about your back? I'm here to tell you right now, your greatest, most powerful physical attribute is your weapon. It is your mind. As according to the Harper's Index in 1991, it, when humans are engaged in intense study, there is 14 watts of power generating up here. You know, back then in 1991, how many watts it took to generate an IBM computer? 90. Not far off, friends. 
This is your power. Psalm chapter 19, at the end of the chapter, he says in verse 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my Redeemer, my power. You notice there in John chapter 1, when he's talking about the Word came in, he gave us the power to become sons of God. Ashley, baby, would you raise your hand and let Mama find you? Thank you, love. So friends, you got to understand that this is what controls everything that you do. It said once that be careful on what you think, on your thoughts. Because your thoughts become your words. Watch your words because your words become your actions. Watch your actions become, they become your character. Watch your character because they will, it will be defined as your identity. Friends, your mind is so powerful. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi in there in chapter 4, and he says, starting in verse 4, Rejoice! I'll say it a second time. Rejoice! The Lord is at hand. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Be careful for nothing but by prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Make your requests known to God. Finally, whatever is honest, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, think, meditate, dwell on these things, and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. You powered up this evening, church? I hope you are. If you're here this evening and you have not gotten your mind right to where you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, you have confessed Him before men in your lifestyle, turn from a lifestyle of sin, turn toward a life of God, and be immersed with Him in that water, being buried with Him in baptism, be buried with Him into the cloud, the God's presence, be, clear, be buried with Him into one body by one Spirit. If you haven't done that, you should do so this evening. If you've done that somewhere along the way, your mind ain't been right, you haven't been thinking clearly, full of thinking errors, you have a chance to turn from that and go a new direction this evening. If you need assistance in retaining your power that is given to you by God with the power of your mind, take hold of that this evening as together as we stand. And as we sit. evening let me tell you let me tell you i love getting to travel and meet brothers and sisters in christ from all over this fine state i've only been a alabamian for nine years but this february will make 10 years i've been in this great state and i am proud to now say i believe i am an alabamian more than that i am a scuffle gridian and for i don't just reside in Gwin, alabama i live in the little little area called scuffle grit and if you ask my mom that'll be very appropriate for me where i live and it's great. I get to walk up that hill every day with my little beagle coon dog mix and uh, now a miniature schnauzer that thinks it's a wolfhound. And I get to enjoy God's beauty in this wonderful state. And I'm so glad I have the opportunity to be here with y'all this evening. I know a lot of y'all do know my big brother, and I will say this, that you know the better right <laughs> brother have been knowing him. That is a fine man who raised some of the finest children I've ever seen, and mainly in part because of his wonderful, wonderful wife, Jensie. And that's another reason why I didn't choose to get married until I found a woman like my mama, like my sister-in-law. And I'm proud to be marrying Ashley Sprinkle next Saturday. If y'all ain't got nothing to do, come to the Coleman Farms at the barn there in Brilliant. And we would start at 6 o'clock, right? Yeah, come on. We, if anything, you get to... get to. <laughs> she's like, you better know. <laughs> this could get ugly real quick, church. Pray for me. More importantly, pray for her. Uh, but if anything, you'll get a good barbecue meal out of it. But uh, I've been assigned the topic this evening on the sacrifice of the peace offering. And I've, I've looked at all your uh, lineup and all that you've learned this summer so far. And boy, I know you've been hit hard and hit well with it. And if this isn't that well, then I know the next two weeks closing out this series will be wonderful. For uh, the two congregations that are, uh, the two preachers that represent the two congregations coming here mean so very much to me. Brother, next week, Brother Ricky Berger from Florence in there at Wood Avenue Church of Christ, they took me in and loved on me when uh, a, lot of, a lot of others wouldn't. 
And they actually helped me get started with my education there at Heritage Christian. And I'm so ever grateful for that congregation. Ricky Berger is such a fine man, a good guy, wonderful family. And closing out will be Brother Scott Baggett the, from the White Chapel congregation, where my sweet Ashley uh, comes from. So he is a wonderful gospel preacher, studied from formerly under the same minds that I studied from informally at Memphis School of Preaching. So you're going to have some good lessons coming up. But this sacrifice of the peace offering, when Mark first offered me it, he offered me this week and next week. And next week looked very, very tempting, but I, I didn't dare try to do that with uh, getting married so close to it. And uh, the sacrifice of the peace offering, if you have to actually go through Leviticus, who here has ever read Leviticus all the way through? Anybody? Yeah, really exciting stuff, isn't it, church? Ah. In fact, there's many people that call it the bloodiest book of the entire Bible. And I can see why. Blood is mentioned so much. Uh, yet people really, I don't think they have ever read Ezekiel 8, 9, and 10 and uh, looked at some of those instances or read through the narrative through the history books that are the kings and 1st 2nd Samuel. But, you know, one thing about peace is, man, you have to find it in yourself. You ever notice when God tells you to love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, heart, soul, and mind, and love thy neighbor? as thyself. Do you ever catch that those last two words as thyself? Have y'all ever considered that? We're taught usually not to be narcissistic and self-involved and love ourselves. But friends, we have to have a healthy sense of love for yourself in order to serve God and serve your neighbor. If you don't serve your neighbor, love your neighbor, you're not loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You have to understand, you are created in the image of God. He knew you before you were in the womb. He can count every hair on your head, can you? Well, I, I'm almost there. He knows you. He loves you. God does not make any junk. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And let God mold you. Let Him make you who you need to be. Let Him help you discover peace. And inner peace, that's something that's really tricky, isn't it? Reminds me of an old Peanuts cartoon. You all know Lucy? Lucy's always talking about, I'm very inner, I have inner peace. I, nothing bothers me. And then not too long later, I hate everybody. I hate the world. I hate everybody in the entire world. Charlie Brown said, Lucy, I thought you had inner peace. <laughs> she says, yeah, I do have inner peace, but I also have exterior obnoxiousness. And, and that's how it seems sometimes, isn't it? And you know, one thing that's neat about this peace offering is the Hebrew term is zeva shalem. Shalem, very, very close to the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. A lot of people like to parse it in a kind of peculiar way to make it mean fellowship or communion, but really this means peace offering. However, fellowship offering, communal offering, is not wrong by implication of it. So let's go ahead and let's jump into the text. I believe I'll be whistled when it's getting close to the time. We're 650. All right, we got time. Let's ride. Leviticus chapter 3 is the first time we see of this. We're dealing with a whole kind of a bunch of offerings. You got burn offerings. You got grain offerings. You got drink offerings. You got whole burn offerings. And now you got this thing called a, a peace offering coming out. And here in verse 3, starting in verse 1, it is written, His oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering. If he offer it to of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. It must be one that is whole and complete. It must be one without any defect. It must be one that is acceptable on the sight of God. And he shall lay his head upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's son, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. Now I want you to look at this for a second. In front of the tabernacle. What's so fancy about this tabernacle? Well, friends, it's where God's presence rested on it. You remember how I talked to you a few minutes ago when I was extending the invitation about how we're baptized into Christ's death and we're baptized into the cloud? That is God's presence. There at the end of Exodus chapter 40, pop quiz real quick. When they were being led through the wilderness, what led them? Pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, yeah. A cloud. God's presence was leading the way, protecting them the whole time. There at Exodus chapter 40, at the end of the construction of the tabernacle, there this great cloud descended on it. Now we're not talking about just some fog, okay? And we'll look more at what kind of that cloud is here in a little bit when we get to 1 Kings 8 with Solomon's dedication to the temple. And this cloud will be so thick. And there, that's where it's supposed to took place. The tent, the tabernacle, and look how they're supposed to 
I just sacrifice, I guess, is, seems so, uh, what do you call it, minimizing when you're actually killing an animal. I am not a hunter. I don't even like killing bugs sometimes except wasps and spiders. I just don't want to kill anything. I look at even my dumb little miniature schnauzer and I look at it and I'm like, I can't hurt you. And believe me, after a Roomba goes over some boo-boo in your house on hardwood floor, you will want to punt a miniature schnauzer into another county. But I have inner peace. And so here, how they were supposed to execute this animal, anybody notice anything particular about it? They're going to cut its throat, but how do they, what do they do before that? They lay their hand on its head. Now, why do you think that is? Comforting to know that this is not just anything that happens daily. It shouldn't happen daily, but it is part of life. And this is happening for worship to the Lord. Now, when we see this later on, now let's go ahead and jump forward to chapter 7 in Leviticus. There's a lot of recapitulation through here, but I want us to look at what... Why is it louder when I get right here? The echo? Hmm. And so here we see verse 11, starting out, The last sacrifice of the peace offering, which he shall offer up unto the Lord. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, unleavened waters anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fried. And other things to add to it. But look at this, a thanksgiving offering. There is another type of offering that is included into this too. And I want you to go down and look at uh, verse 16. If it be an offering for a vow. Y'all know what a vow is, don't you? We're going to look at a few examples of those in a few minutes too. And you go on down a few more verses and you see that this is actually just a participation. Now, where would they get fellowship or communion offering from? Who are they fellowshipping with? Who are they communing with? God. And now I want you to think about it. Thanksgiving, votive vow, or a free will offering. These are the three types that are involved with a peace offering. Now, if we go back through scriptures, we don't see a whole lot of this until the time of Jacob. And then when his name is changed into Israel. And then we go on and we see in Israel in the days of Moses. So these type of things they just didn't happen all the time with, these vo- with the vows. But the fellowship, the free will, and the thanksgiving offering, we see as early as Job. We see that what Job offered every day, every morning, early in the morning, he would get up and go do what? Offer sacrifices for each of his children. That is kind of what we see. In fact, we go back even further than that to Genesis 4, when Cain and Abel are approaching God. This is something that we see as well. It's one that's just a free will praising God for who he is. And you remember, you notice that in Job... There it says that the day where the sons of God came to present themselves unto the Lord. A lot of people think that that sons of God means angels. Let me assure you, it does not. It does not. For we see there in Genesis chapter 4, sons of God, Cain and Abel, coming to present themselves before the Lord. One acceptable, one looked on with favor, one not looked on with favor. And we see this also with Job in his day. Now I want you to think about these offerings, what it costs. Someone that was wealthy like Job, it's probably a drop in the bucket, right? But however, certain people couldn't always afford that. And they did what they could. And when you take these free will offerings and these thanksgiving offerings, what are some things you think that they would thank God for back in those days? What are some of the things you thank God about in your life? Your daily needs? Do you thank God for your daily provisions? Your food? Your shelter? Your clothing? Yeah, of course you do. The roof over your head? The clothes that you get to wear? Oh, thank you, Lord, for the air conditioning. Thank you for internet. Thank you for a a phone that's the size of a playing card that I can talk to anybody I really want to. But what about in their day? Safety and security. They didn't live in a free United States like we did. Sometimes there was danger all around them. In fact, is that not what happened with Job in his day? Not only did fire come from heaven, burn the livestock, but thieves and raiders came in. Boy, Satan and his powers. Isn't that something? 
You know, so we see that this offering took place in many positions, but there's also some big parts that we need to look at when it comes to the thanksgiving, the free will, and the votive. First, I want to spend some time on this vows. Have you ever made a vow before? I know you two have. I know some of you two have. I know some of y'all have. Some of y'all who are married, you've made vows. I get to make my vows in nine, nine days. In nine days. I've got to quit checking for confirmation in front of people. I'm going to get smacked. Uh, we make a vow when we go into the bonds of marriage, into holy matrimony. But have you ever made another vow? Let's say a relative was dying. Did you ever try to bargain with God? You know, some people also have tried to do that. You know, the first time we see anybody address God as Lord Almighty, Yahweh Shara, we see is not a man, but we see a woman. Do you know that? One of the most... We're going to look at actually two vows from women. I want to look at Hannah first. Actually, you know what? We're going to look at Jephthah first. Turn to Judges chapter 11, friends. Boy, vows. We see some of the vows that were made were kept. Jacob, Israel. But when it comes to the days of the right before the United Kingdom in a time of real just apostasy, backsliding left and right constantly. Oh, well, we'll serve you, God. We'll keep your commandments holy. And then all of a sudden, worshiping little G gods again and again. And in Judges chapter 11, we meet this man who is called Jephthah. And Jephthah was a Gileadite, and he was a mighty man of valor, but he was a son of a harlot. And his biological father and his wife and their children would not stand him. And he took off. And he had to make a, a, a vow with some other people to say, look, if I do this and I'm successful, I will be your leader. And it came time that those Ammonites were coming through that they were getting pretty thick. You know, the Ammonites really should have been cousins. Actually, were cousins to the Hebrew people, to the Israelites. Y'all remember where we first saw them? Ammon and Moab in Genesis 19 at the ugly, ter terrible, nasty end of, of that horrific historical narrative. And these people should have been family, but yet they were a thorn in the flesh of Israel. And here they are, and they hear the Spirit of the Lord, verse 29, and came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead. From Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And look at verse 30. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt fall, then deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. You know, when we're told in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus that we make a vow, make an oath, we are to do all we can to fulfill it as quickly, as expediently as possible. I want us to keep that in mind. Y'all remember Absalom? There in First King, 2 Kings 15? where after he had returned back from Hebron, after four years, he went to his father and said, let me go and fulfill my offering, my vow, back to Hebron. Was he going there to do that? Absolutely not. He was going to lead a rebellion. And you know what happened to him? It wasn't pretty. Subterfuge always meets brutal ends. But here, Jephthah made this vow. He said, if you deliver those Yemenites into my hand, then when we return home in peace, whatever comes out of my house, I will offer up as a burnt offering. It'll be the Lord's. And you know what it says when we're making oaths also, if anything is declared to the Lord, it is holy, it is the Lord's. There is no buying it back. Let's keep that in mind. And you know, he gets home after the defeat of the Ammonites. And look here, he came to Mizpah, verse 34, his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Oh. And it came to pass when he saw her, he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And he, she said unto him, My father, if you've opened the mouth, your mouth unto the Lord, 
Do to me according to that which proceedeth out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord has taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this be done for me. Let me go with my friends up on the mountain and mourn for two months. And then we'll come back and you can fulfill that vow. And he granted her that. And she went up on the mountain with her friends, mourned her virginity for two months, and then came back and then Jephthah killed his only daughter, torn her asunder, his only daughter, and offered her as a burnt offering, his only daughter. You know, but still, I want you to think of this. Abraham was told to do the same thing, not because he made a vow, but because God wanted to know after that rough road Abraham had if he could really trust Abraham and Abraham did not have to go through it. And let's make no mistake, that sacrifice would not have been Abraham's. It would have been Isaac's sacrifice. This is the most beautiful soul in the entire Old Testament. And I don't even know what to call her other than Jephthah's daughter. And I feel like that's disgracing her. That was a peace offering. That was a vow offering. Do you ever think he ran his mouth to the Lord again? You think he learned his lesson? All right, let's got to move on, y'all. Sorry about that. Turn me now to something that's more beautiful. A scene that'll leave you smiling. A scene that'll leave your heart full. A piece of history that'll make so much beauty in your heart. You will rejoice. See, there was this lady called Hannah. She had this husband named Elkanah who also had another wife, but Hannah's womb was closed up. She could not bear children. And Elkanah's wife, Panea, she could, and she flaunted it aggressively in front of Hannah. And it troubled Hannah. You know, my mother is here this evening, a wonderful, bold woman after raising me and many. I don't think there's anything that can scare this lady. Her she had a neighbor come out and yelling at her for throwing grass buttons across the street the other day. And she, you know what she did? How dare you yell at me like this? You need to go read your Bible. That's a tough woman right there. But you know, things I learned from her is that Benny and I were adopted for a reason. We were both, had, apparently, I was premature and we both had, had the exact same birthday 10 years apart. But my mother wanted children. She was a faithful Christian. And somehow God's providence shined through brighter than it ever has that I've seen in anybody's life. So my mama, I know, can identify with this, and maybe some of you sisters can too. That sometimes, friends, you know, Hannah's grief turned her into a theologian. Do you know that? Do you have anything that's grieving you today? I hope it don't let it consume you. I hope you let that turn you into a theologian. I hope that turns you into a little minister, a little M minister of the Lord. You can do so much. And look at verse 11. She was of bitterness of soul, prayed unto the Lord, wept sore, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord, her husband opened a smart mouth and said to her, your lips were moving, but I didn't hear nothing. You got to be drunk. He says, drunk. Anybody ever think you're crazy because you trust in God? Isn't that something? How you, something that's belief and faith in God, someone can think of as you being inebriated or consumed. That's something. But do you know what? Look at verse 24. We all know that she conceived Sam, uh, uh, Samuel and brought him forth. And you know what Samuel means? God heard me. Shema. That's the Hebrew word for hear. Samuel. God heard me. And when she had weaned him, she took him with her with three bowls, one ephah of flour, one bottle of wine, brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. They slew the bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am, thy, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, what I asked him. Therefore, I have now lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Question there. What animal was the peace offering there in the votive offering, in the vow? 
What was the animal? Y'all look at me crazy. You're like, man, it wasn't an animal. It was Samuel. Isn't that something? Y'all know this? Hannah had a few other sons and a few other daughters. God opened her womb after that. And she didn't forget Samuel. No, 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 no. Every year they'd go there to make out sacrifices. She brought him a new cloak, a new garment. In some places that's translated as glory, especially within the uh, context of Elijah and Elisha with their cloak. What a refreshing thought. Because Samuel not only became the last judge of Israel, not only did he become a priest of Israel, but he also became a prophet. One of the first of the many to come. And notice that we look back in Scripture, the first time we see Abraham labeled as a prophet, anyone labeled as a prophet, was Abraham when uh, God was talking to Abimelech there in Genesis chapter 20. And that's something. You know the influence that we have if we are stick to our word, let our yes be yes and our no be no, what that can say about us. And boy, let me tell you, what does it say to the Lord about who you are? That is a peace offering. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. But also be thankful. And be willing to just offer up God sacrifices when you're ready. And I'm not taking about, talking about going outside and killing the sheep and setting it on fire. But we'll get to that in a minute. First Kings chapter 8, we see the inauguration, the dedication of the temple. Y'all know what the Hebrew word dedication is? I bet you recognize it when you hear it. Hanukkah. Y'all know that? Hanukkah is the Hebrew word for dedication. And here, this temple, it's been completed for almost a year and furnished as it goes in this uh, extra year. But they get to this time of the year where it's a feast to dedicate it, to make this happen. And Solomon assembles the whole elders of Israel and they assembled all the children of Israel. You know, that's something right there. You notice today we like to talk about, you know, Hebrews 10 there in verse 25 where he says, forsake not the assembly. Okay, that's true. You know, the next verse says, so if we go on sinning deliberately, talking about is it a sin not to attend, I believe so. I would like to have seen someone tell those elders and Solomon no when they called the assembly. You didn't tell the king no. And remember today, we shouldn't tell the king no when it comes to suiting up, showing up, and stirring up one another to love and good works. Anyway, there's your sermonette inside of a sermon. Look here, though. This inauguration of this temple. Everybody's there. All the men of Israel assembled themselves in the King Solomon. And all the elders came, and the priests took up the ark, and they brought the ark in. And look here at verse 5. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. Well, you know, the chronicler tries to number it. He gives a couple numbers there, sheep and oxen, there in Second Chronicles chapter 7. But, you know, you look at this and see what's going on. Everybody's offering up. And see, this offering is different. This is the one burnt offering that can be made where not only can the priests, but also the people who offered it can eat of the meat. The right thigh, the breast, the fat, the kidneys, the liver, all that was to be offered up onto the uh, altar and burned as an offering. The blood splashed on the sides of the altar. But yet here, this is something that people could partake in as well. And look at this. The amount of that must have been, if you look at Second Chronicles 7, and I don't think we have time to, so we're not going to, but it's, you're talking like 20,000, 120,000. That's a lot of animals. You can imagine the barbecue that was taking place there that day, and all of it was a fellowship, communion, peace offering, a dedication offering, because they were grateful that God let this happen. I mean, Solomon there... After his prayer, or before his prayer, that cloud descends and fills up the entire temple. People are getting afraid. And he says this, God, I want you to turn the page over. Look down in verse 33. He goes on saying, you've been good to your servants. David, my father before him, he purposed in his heart to build me this temple, but yet he couldn't build it. But yet it was good that he purposed to do so in his heart. You've been good to me. You've blessed me. You've blessed your people. And then he gets on down to something a little bit more 
well, disconcerting sometimes. Look, when verse 33, When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house. That's exactly the sixth cycle that took place through the narrative of the history of Judges. And look at verse 34. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people. Hear in heaven to Shema HaShemayim. To Shema HaShemayim. To Shema HaShemayim. Does it sound poetic? Because it's meant to be. I want you to think about this for a second, friends. Challenge time. Why would God have to hear in heaven if His cloud, His presence is right then and there, right at that moment? Why would God have to hear from heaven? Friends, this truth is simple. Draw nigh to God, He will draw nigh to thee. Draw away from God, He will draw away from thee. And Ezekiel 8, 9, and 10 is probably the saddest chapters of the entire Old Testament. There in chapter 8, Ezekiel is snatched up by the hair by God in a vision and taken from Babylon to Jerusalem. We're talking like a thousand miles. That's a long trip to be holding by the hair. And he shows them all the idolatry that's taking place at the temple. The calf out front. The, all the snakes and things that are in the inside. People are wimp, weeping for theoretical heroes that never existed. The elders are outside east worshiping the sun. God's had enough. He called in his banger squad. He called in angels. It was bloody. It was sad. Friends, when we sin against God, we push Him away from us. And when we do, may we come to ourselves like that prodigal son and pray to God, and may He shema hashemaya, may He hear in heaven. Do you notice that this prayer takes place immediately after a peace offering, a fellowship offering, a free will offering? Let us not forget that just because we offer up sacrifices, that God will leave us if we push Him away from us. But there's good news. When we do that, He will hear us if we pull back to Him. Now friends, I want us to take a few minutes and look forward. I want us to take a few minutes and look forward in Romans chapter 12. He says, Therefore, by the mercies of our Lord, I beseech you that you present your lives as a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable in the sight of God. And I want you not to be conformed to this world, but I want you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good, acceptable, perfect, whole will of God. You know that word perfect in the Greek is translated from the Koine word teleos. This word has rather a broad semantic range all kind of coupling together. It means whole. It means complete. It means mature means perfect not like sinless perfect who here has had a baby recently anybody have a baby recently anybody have a grandbaby recently no yeah when that little grandbaby came forward they said he's perfect she's perfect right you know what they said all his eyes ears limbs fingers toes legs everything's right where it should be it's a whole perfect baby that's what he's trying to say here you not live a life perfect because you're not going to do that but live it whole, complete, mature, Lord. And he says, look at that. Present yourselves as what? A living sacrifice. Think about Christ. Think about his disciples, the apostles. Think about some of those who have gone before some of you. These juggernauts of faith who lived their lives. And some of the things that they could have done with their lives, but now they chose to serve God first and foremost. All the fame and the fortune they probably could have achieved, but serving God was more important to them. That's how it should be for us. Live as your life, as it is a sacrifice to God. And let's not forget what we're told in Hebrews chapter 10, where we're told that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. And every year that that happened, there was a reminder of sin. But when Christ came along for that once and for all sacrifice where remission exists, 
there remains no sin. This is what we do for our lives. And now we're thankful for that second law of pardon, are we not? Let me tell you something, let me tell you something. What James says there in James chapter 5 where he says, Confess your faults to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. You ever notice that word restored? It means that you were not whole. It means that you were not complete. It means you're not mature. It means you were not perfect the way God wanted you to strive for. But instead, when we do that, He's able to restore us and never minimize prayer. I'm going to kind of let out a little something that's very, very personal. And I do request your prayers on this matter. It's been a hard year. It's been beautiful with the fact of being engaged to Ashley. But next Saturday, it's going to be a little bittersweet too. We lost Daddy two months ago. And now, Ashley, last week, we went to Tuscaloosa and she had an MRI. And for the life of me, these people who get paid entirely too much money an hour, it took a whole week to get back with her about the results. There's some imagery that makes them suspicious of a brain aneurysm. And these people who get paid entirely too much still have yet to call her to schedule an MRA where they can go in and, and look at the blood vessels and confirm or did not dismiss it. Please pray for my family. Pray for my mama who's going through a period of change. Pray for my fiance. But you know what? We wouldn't change anything now. Because whatever we go through, we're going to do it together. We're going to do it together with God. We're going to live our lives as a sacrifice. We're going to always know that no matter what we do, we'll never be worthy, but we don't have to be because we've been extended grace by Christ. We've been given a chance, a chance that many people will deny in this world. And I, I don't understand it, friends. I really don't. Because when times like this, when my heart gets tender and I do weep a little bit, forgive me, but let me tell you something. The other night while planning the wedding in my head, the ceremony, I've done a few weddings, so I'm kind of doing the layout for it to give it to the person that's going to organize it. And I, I couldn't stop crying thinking about Daddy not being there. But then I opened this magical hack called Tip -tock, TikTok, and I started searching biblical evidences. Noah's Ark's been found. It's been there since the 80s. There in the mountains where, where the Scripture tells us it's at. Sodom and Gomorrah has been found. You know that? There at the uh, southwest corner of the Dead Sea, there is a huge mass grave with so many thousands and thousands of skeletal remains that are charred and burned and sulfur balls everywhere. Do you know that southeast of Egypt, there's one particular beach that's just so beautiful and it's so actually good enough to cross when, the, when everything's low enough, the waters recede. But yet that doesn't happen often. And you know you dive in there, and all around, each way, thousands of human remains and chariots. You know how I find peace? I use my eyes. You know, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus told them the parable of the sower. He says, the sower goes out to sow. Some of them fall upon the wayside, some fall among rocky ground, some fall among thorns, and some fall on good ground. It's almost like he's telling us one out of four will be receptive of the gospel. Isn't that cool? Jesus gave us statistics. But later on in the chapter, he tells us, you have to see, yes, but you need to observe. You hear, but you need to listen. And if you don't do that, you will never understand in your heart. Then you will never be com converted. And then you will never be made whole. And I love the fact that when I search for answers in this world, I know I can see them. And that's how I can live my life at peace.
and I don't have to be like Lucy where I only say I have inner peace. I'm not going to be hating the world and everybody in it, but I'm going to be praying for the world and everybody in it. Paul once said that if I could just trade my soul for the entire Israel, man, I'd do it. But he knew he couldn't. It's something we each have to do as we go through life. And we have to meet it on its own terms, just as Christ did. One of the hardest things to do is not be in control of your own life and all the things that happen in it. But like I talked about in that invitation, we can control this. And when we control our thinking, that peace that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ, and we can live as living sacrifices. I've uh, exhausted myself. I cut a lot out <laughs> because I didn't want to go over. But here I want to ask you a few questions, or ask and see if y'all have any questions that y'all want to bring up. Is there anything that pricks your mind or pricks your interest in this matter? We got eight minutes, or probably less. Any criticisms? Anyone want to throw a shoe at me? I can dodge. Guys, I, I love you so much. I'm very, very proud of you. And I want you to know this. No matter what you're going through, living your life as a peace offering, a fellowship offering, communal offering, is something it takes time to. But yet that word there, teleos, mature, it's something that we have to grow into. You know, Confucius was asked once, when did you find yourself to be mature? You know what age Confucius said? What age do you think? 33? 40? Confucius says, I think when I reached 70, I finally became mature. And that's something. What a life it can take. But never to give up. Never tap out. Never surrender. And please, live your life as a peace offering, holy and acceptable unto God, that you may prove what is whole and perfect, God's will. I love you so much. Let's go ahead and go to prayer. So be it. Father in heaven, we are blessed and highly favored to be alive this day, to have the measure of health that we have, and to most importantly be found children in thy sight through thy Son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for the peace that he offers us in our hearts and minds, and we're thankful for the peace that we can live out in this chaotic world through the storm. Let us now go in peace, Father. Be with each soul here, Father, and keep them from evil. Protect them and let them remain physically and spiritually fit always. For all these things we ask in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.